Welcome to Open Classroom, the Brown School's digital forum for community and conversation. We are so glad that you're here today. My name is Laurie McConnell. I'm communications coordinator at the Brown School. And today we kick off a six part series of Open Classroom webinars titled Building a Transformative 21st Century Research Agenda. This is presented in partnership with the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare and the Brown School right here at Washington University in St. Louis. It will be my honor to introduce you to some brilliant people involved with those great institutions. But first, I want to quickly do just a little bit of housekeeping. We're using a webinar format, which means that unfortunately, we can't see or hear you, but we would love to know your thoughts and questions, please feel free to post them in the chat at any time. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of our program. I also want to let you know that we're going to be sharing a survey with you at the end of this program. We'll put a link in the chat. So please don't leave us early. We are incredibly interested in your thoughts. We would love it if you take just a minute. It's a very brief survey. Just complete it and send it and it'll make us better. So we will talk about that um, before the end of the program too. And if you have a colleague or friends who weren't able to get registered, they're not as lucky as you and they're not in the Zoom room with us, uh, but they would like to join in, I can put a link in the chat because we're streaming live on YouTube. So I'll do that in just a moment. And uh, I also want to tease some future open classroom programs that you can register for. Next Thursday is part two of this six webinar series. And uh, it's going to be developing partnerships for implementation in child welfare services really important. Uh, that webinar like this one is going to start a little later than our usual open classrooms. So that'll be at two o'clock central. Then Tuesday, September 27th, we start this year's iChad speaker series by exploring economic strengthening interventions among caregivers in sub-Saharan Africa. That'll be a 1230 central start. On Thursday, September 29th, we are back to this wonderful series with our own Dr. Mary McKay, who will discuss collaborative research methods to elevate the voices of youth, adult caregivers, and providers in child and family-focused studies. We just added a program on Wednesday, October 5th, about the Indian Child Welfare Act as it faces scrutiny in the Supreme Court this fall. So I will share a link to our Open Classroom website so you can register for any of those that interest you. They're always fascinating. They're always free and they're always better when you're here with us. But now I will stop blathering and get on to today's program. I am very honored to introduce one of our facilitators for today, Cynthia Williams, Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships at the Brown School. Thank you, Cynthia, for being here. Uh, Cynthia will help us with our question and answer session, along with Nicholas Asher, who is a program and project assistant at Washington University and an MSW and MSP candidate, so very sleepy, but very hardworking. And I am also honored to introduce Dr. Mary McKay, president of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare and vice provost of interdisciplinary initiatives here at Washington University. And Dr. McKay, I think you joined the Brown School as dean in 2016. 16, and you've been the Academy President since 2012. Is that right? And you also find time to do amazing research. You teach mm -hmm. young people. You author hundreds you. of articles. You're very, very busy. And I'm going to hand things over to you so you can explain the purpose of this webinar series and also give you the joy of introducing our presenters for today. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And thank you, everybody that is here with us either uh, in, on our webinar uh, or on YouTube. It is my privilege to welcome you. And I'm going to do that from a couple of different roles. Um, I am the, the president of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. We rep I represent a board of directors. I represent a set of academy fellows. And so, Lori, I was uh, inducted as a fellow in 2012. So what does it mean to be a fellow of the academy? It means that you are trying to drive forward the profession of social work, particularly how do we create new knowledge that puts good into the world. And so that rapid translation of research and knowledge into action, into practice, into policy, into organization is, and, and, and so Academy Fellows, uh, my colleagues in the Academy are, are real leaders in really trying to make our profession and the knowledge that we create make a difference. Um, so, so this series, is, um, is, is co-sponsored by the Academy. Thanks Brown School for supporting us as always at Washington University. We're also here 
because there's a particular audience that um, that our foundation partners want to reach in order to really be able to create a 21st century research agenda that truly supports young people and their families and 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 creates connections with communities like never before. And so so what's that 21st century research agenda about? It is driven by three foundations, Annie Casey, the Casey Family Programs and WT Grant Foundation. Those three foundations came together and put together a coalition of who? Of researchers like myself, of practitioners, of system leaders, and most importantly, a set of people with lived experience. People that had been young people that had touched the systems that, that they were trying to transform. Uh, family members, providers, system leaders. And, and so these three foundations, along with our coalition, are deeply committed to advancing research that will really help kids, families, and communities. But to do that research in a particular way that allows for more partnership, more voice, more collaboration than many of our traditional kind of ways we put together study. This collaboration um, you know, with people with direct experience is incredibly important to this series. And so, so that's now what I wanna thank our speakers for. So Trisha Stevens, Hope Newton, this is a powerful partnership. Um, two people that, uh, Trisha, that I know for decades and Hope, who I just met right now, but I'm particularly impressed, Hope, with the strength of your voice and your commitment to Trisha and vice versa in terms of creating work that matters. Um, and so, so I think that what I'm so interested for both Trisha and Hope, they'll say a few words about biography, how they came together, and then we'll go into our presentation. I do hope we leave some questions um, so that we, Nicholas and Cynthia can answer, uh, ask you some questions and you have some time to, to answer those as well. Please also, those of you to, that have signed on here, um, Nicholas put in the chat a link to the executive summary uh, for the 21st century research agenda. And those of you that are watching on uh, YouTube, since you registered, you'll also get that uh, via your registration link after the, our, our presentation is over. So with that, Trisha, Hope, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we're gonna be glued to every word that you say uh, about how you put together research that actually matters and your contributions in that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mary. Um, I do have a PowerPoint to um, share with everyone. So Hope, um, do you want to start uh, introducing yourself while I bring up the PowerPoint? Um, and then I'll follow. <laughs> Excuse me. My name is Hope Newton. And what brings me to this work is uh, the fact that I am an impacted parent. Um, I came, I was introduced to uh, child welfare um, by my husband, was my husband over 14 years ago in the midst of, <clears throat> in the midst of a contentious uh, divorce as a survivor of domestic violence. Um, and basically uh, that brought me into this work and I became an advocate and through advocacy and working in so many different spaces, I just really vowed that I did not want anyone to go through what I, I went through. I'm a mother of three children. My daughter describes it much better than I do. She says, mom, you were in a domestic violence and child welfare chokehold for over a decade. And being on one side of the court table and then working on the opposite side as a parent advocate, with a law firm that represented, represented parents with open child protective service cases, being involved in the community, and now working as a program officer with a foundation who uh, gives funding to things related to child welfare or what we call the family surveillance or the family policing system. So I just have a, a pretty broad lens when it comes to this work. And um, Trish? Thanks. Thanks, Hope. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tricia Stevens. I'm an assistant professor at the Hunter College Silverman School of Social Work here in New York City. Um, I've called New York City my home for um, pretty much uh, just over half of my life. 
Um, I originate from uh, Jamaica, not Jamaica, Queens, but Jamaica, the actual island, and bring many of my cultural beliefs and um, upbringing from being raised in Jamaica to the work that I do, to the ways in which I view family, um, to the ways in which I actually conduct my research. Um, Hope and I met, we were recounting the story of how we met uh, to Mary just before we started this um, webinar. And it was because I was, even though I know New York very well, I was lost walking around the streets looking for um, the office of a, a grassroots organization of which we're both really deeply connected to. Hope, are you still the, the, the chair um, of, of the board or um, are, are you like transitioning? You're doing so many things right now. We can hear you, Hope, your, your mic. Of this new role as a program. Uh, it's still a little low. It's still a little low. Okay. In my new role there you go. at Red Lick Horowitz Foundation, it really requires that I bring my total personal and professional experience and uh -huh. all the experience that I have into this role because it's very unique from direct service. So I had to transition from that. From that to role. Okay. Of their advisory board. So but I'm deeply connected to guys. Yeah. I think we all are connected. And this is, I think this speaking about how to do this work in a transformative manner, um, none of us is ever disconnected from each other. Um, I've known hope, I don't know how long I've known hope, but I see hope everywhere. Um, and in the places where it matters around uh, talking specifically about black families in the child welfare system in New York City, um, I can rely on hope being present or being part of the conversation in a very meaningful way. So whether it's at organizations where many of us started to um, meet each other like CWAP or RISE or even the narrowing the front door to um, black families entering the child welfare system where hope was on the working group, um, I was also on that working group and, and uh, served as a co-chair um, you see the ways in which our worlds interlock. Um, I want to go ahead and um, give us some acknowledgments here. Um, there are many organizations in New York City. We have, we're pretty blessed in New York City. We're not, we won't make the claim that we're at the forefront of this, but we have a pretty strong um, uh, advocacy disruptor ally group in New York. Um, and that's going from grassroots organizations, um, organizations that are legal organizations in the city that are deeply committed to addressing the injustice that has been the typical practices in child welfare, um, specifically when it comes to black families um, and Latin families as well in our city. Um, but most of all, this is a, a, a special note that always to acknowledge the um, honesty and generosity with which parents share their stories. Um, sharing is always done purposefully because it is hard to share. I cannot tell you how many times that I have co-presented um, with, with Hope or with other co-presenters where we have to prep ahead of time for the emotion that comes up from sharing. Um, it is not easy to go back to this experience for most people because it is in fact a really hard part of their lives. Um, and most people, if they can avoid it, they do. So acknowledging deeply appreciating that honesty and generosity. We're both thankful to the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare and Brown School at WashU for this invitation to share in this space. We're excited to talk to you about how to work um, collaboratively and hope that we're actually um, already uh, modeling that for you. Um, I want a special shout out to Hunter's PSC CUNY Enhanced E-Grant Mechanism uh, for funding the court project, the um, Families, Parents Experiences of Court um, project that uh, I will talk about towards the end of this presentation. Um, but first, we're going to start with Hope is going to uh, kick us off with a few notes. 
um, of introduction orienting us to what we will discuss today with you. Then we're going to be very intentional about speaking about the experiences of Black families in the child welfare system. It is why we both um, do this work with the passion that we do. It is um, a, an injustice that has been persistent, but in order to address it, we have to know where it's coming from if we are seeking to change it through research. Then we're going to talk about research on versus knowledge development in partnership with families. And then I will provide a case example of the parents' experiences in family court and have some time for discussion. You will notice that in our presentation style, while there are slides um, that Hope and I will be going back and forth, even though I'll be doing most of the presenting on the slides, Hope and I will go back and forth in our um, discussion of main points on those slides. Hope? Yes, so just, just want to thank you for taking the time to come and listen. Um, why it's important to collaborate and center the voices of the communities that you're going into. And what's the best approach? We're going to talk to you about how, how it's done, why it's important, the best, best approach on going into unfamiliar communities. Um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel or repeat past mistakes. You're going to get a historical context, uh, some about something about the worst case scenarios or the worst outcomes in Black and Indian communities. We'll talk about the disproportionalities. And mostly, we're going to dispel some myths. Some of you may not realize that you hold on to some myths unintentionally. And it's important for us to name and claim those myths because it's important for us to get on with the work at hand. Name and claim what those myths are, those unintentional biases. Name and claim that because the research that you're going to do is important. Also, two things that I want everyone to really hold on to in grounding this work that you do. There's two basic things. One, the communities, the marginalized communities that you'll go in to do interviews, they're 10 years ahead of you. They're 10 years ahead of you because of their lived experience. You're going in to provide the data and the information that the foundations and the policymakers and all the stakeholders need to justify or verify why the work needs to be done. Two, understand that you are consulting with lived experience experts. The resiliency, the resiliency to survive living in a marginalized community deserves nothing but respect over pity and fear-based approaches. Understand that anyone who agrees to interview with you, they are giving you more than you can ever give them. And why do I say that? Because when, if and when your research goes viral, as they say now, your research will be quoted in articles, journals, you'll have invitations to speak on local, national, international platforms with the media, People will interview you, but the communities that you interview will still be grappling with some of those same issues when you interview them. So we ask that you lean into curiosity with humility and respect for the families that are going to teach you more than you could have ever learned in the classroom. Thank you. Trish. Thank you, Hope. Um, so I love this photo that we have that I have up on my screen. It's huge here. Um, uh, Mary, you might remember this photo from when I was a talk student at NYU. Um, it was one of the photos that I used in my dissertation. Um, and it, I love this photo because it really supports what I believe and why I do this work. Um, that if we support this beautiful mom on the left, that she is best positioned um, to make a good and happy home and supportive life for this small person um, to my right as I'm observing it. And I truly do believe this. And this is why I do this work. Um, I was really fortunate to grow up in spaces where um, I didn't even know what the gift was of just seeing this, this mom, little girl dyad as a family. 
Um, but coming to the United States and being introduced to um, the very deep realities of life as a Black person in the United States um, really grounded me as I became more mature in the system and understanding that there are many folks who really don't see the mom on the left as a mom, as someone who's capable, as someone who's able and willing and, 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 and wanting to be um, in the role of mom. And so in order to understand this work, um, we have to take you back in history because if we do things in an ahistorical manner and simply look at outcomes, if we do research that looks at outcomes without understanding who people are, we're going to have a very um, slanted view of, of communities. Um, and as, as um, Hope said beforehand, communities are at this point in time used to researchers coming in and harvesting from the community um, and sometimes presenting data without understanding who they are as people and, and really presenting um, viewpoints that are have eventually become harmful to communities. But I'm going to start us off with a quote from Dr. Dorothy Roberts's new book, Torn Apart. Um, and I'll read it aloud for you because this really, this quote really should cause every single one of us to pause and reflect because at this point in time, we're over a hundred years into our present formulation of the child welfare system, right? When we, when this started out in the twenties, black people were not even um, allowed to be served in child welfare um, agencies. Um, so Dr. Robert says, if this system were truly devoted to protecting children and promoting their welfare, why weren't the vast majority of its clients white? The United States has consistently reserved its best resources for white people. Black people have had to fight tooth and nail to gain access to services meant for whites only. Conversely, the institutions where government has confined Black people, like segregated schools, housing, and prisons, have been substandard. Why would this state system that takes children from their parents be any different? And I want you to think about that quote because many people actually view the child welfare um, system consistently today still as a benevolent system. Um, I think that People are becoming more critical and aware, um, but in black communities, the terms, and, and hope you can help me out here. Uh, one of the terms I became very familiar with when I was a young social worker in New York was baby snatcher. That was what social workers were called in communities of color. And so you had this dichotomous image of the child welfare system as a very benevolent system versus how it was actually enacted in communities. Do you want to add to that, Hope? Yeah, it's like a tale of two cities in a way. Um, it's a tale of the systemic impact on communities. There's a systems perspective that we are in there to help and protect children. And what families experience is not protection. Families experience a system that was designed to either help and support or protect their children. We, families experience a system that exacerbates any problems that they may have, even though we're told they're coming in to help. So there is a, a generational distrust of all systems, not just child protective, but all the systems that intersect with them um, from the education system to the police, all of these things are considered one and the same and looked at as the same. So understand that when you go into the communities in terms of that is a huge distrust and warranted based on how communities experience these systems. Awesome. I wanna build on that term that you use mistrust, hope. And, and a lot of times when I write about this, I, I attach the word earned to that mistrust or distrust that communities have, because I think it has to be very humbly acknowledged that the, the mistrust didn't just evaporate from anywhere. It's generational, as you said. 
Um, I am a, 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 a a huge fan of the work of um, Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, um, who pioneered the use of historical trauma theory. And Dr. Um, Braveheart, she identifies as a Lakota woman, um, a, a social work researcher. Um, she's a scientist and scholar. And she was really disheartened to see the ways in which her people, her tribes people, which essentially were her, her grandfathers, her, her grandparents, mothers, her mother, father, sister, brother, uncles and aunts being written about in the literature, um, because um, many of us may be familiar with the very heavy burden that Native people carry in this country. And that burden um, oftentimes shows up as um, being scoring very low on achievement of the social determinants of health, right? And so more likely to have heavy disease burden, heavy substance use mental health burden. Um, and uh, Dr. Braveheart looked at the literature that documented these outcomes in an ahistorical manner. So in order to um, avoid doing that today, we wanted to take you back in history a little bit to ground you in where some of this generational mistrust originates from. Um, and that really is uh, that the system that we currently see dominated by Black families as um, Dr. Roberts um, tells us it is, and it, it remains so, right, the disproportionality of um, Black and Native children is quite remarkable. Um, that wasn't the case originally. In the, in the very beginnings of the American um, consciousness around seeing children as um, beings who were deserving of being protected and raised under conditions of um, health and well-being, um, Black children could not access, Black families could not access those um, those services. Their segregation was legal. Um, it was widely practiced. And if uh, Black families were given access to a very few institutions, and oftentimes when those children were um, received in, into those institutions, they it happened under the worst of conditions. And so Rosner and Markowitz, there's a, a, a quick reference page for you to check out some of this literature we use here um, at the end of the presentation, which will be made available to you. They uh, very specifically identify that Black children in particular were labeled as mentally ill, delinquent, or even criminal in order to receive services. Um, so those, um, those the, the language that was utilized um, uh, to describe Black children, many people would think of as that's extremely harsh language, but it was actually commonly practiced if Black children were entered into the system. And so you see this shifting of not just segregation, but um, a dehumanization in many ways once access was gained during those years. So it matters how we actually document, as Dr. Braveheart um, uh, cautions us around how we use epistemology to, um, to gather information, but how it's utilized and what it's utilized to support can actually become unacceptable, right? Um, so it's our ways of gathering knowledge or ways of being once we use that knowledge. So once we move from a, a point of segregation and into um, desegregation, we start to think, okay, this is a good thing. We should be seeing the opening up of services, the very same services um, to a wider group of people, but that's actually not what happened, right? So as we started seeing the end of segregation, um, and Black families start to access services, the child welfare system starts to shift its practices, formally a primarily in-home and supportive model. Um, I actually remember doing interviews back in 2012 with, um, with moms who were living in East Harlem, and they remembered that the model of child welfare when they were children um, was in home. Uh, so, so this was 2012, they were in their 50s. So 
this would have been like the 1960s, they still had a model of in-home supportive um, uh, uh, child welfare um, practice, or many of them because of the neighborhood they were in, there was a, a uh, a Catholic church, I think it was called St. Teresa's at the time, um, that many of them were very clear that's where they, their, their mothers would go to um, to get help. And I'm using the word mothers to reflect the language used by the mothers. In fact, yes, they were mothers that I interviewed primarily. Um, but they started to shift um, the into a more out-of-home placement and um, model, and also where the the viable option of in-home was just not seen as palatable anymore. Um, and, and not only was it seen as a frontline option of out-of-home placement, but it was also funded as a primary option for many families. And starting around the 1980s, and this is around the time of the crack epidemic where it was a, a major shift in the practices of out of home placement um, for mothers and especially for families of color. Um, do you wanna add anything to that, Hope? I think one thing is interesting when we're giving a historical context and the timing, the transition during the 60s and 70s, we also know what was going on in the 60s in terms of tumult, tumult that was going on across the country, the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, and a lot of other movements to talk about the uh, Jim Crow and how those things and those policies. So there was a, a lot of activism. So I find it very interesting if we look at the context of what was going on across the country and what was happening with these policies uh, in terms of how that segregation, um, how it, it played out, how these things um, have impacted families moving forward. Um, you felt like with the gains that were made in the 60s, from a global perspective, people would have said, oh, all the things that were done in the 60s, people of color, Blacks should be so much further along because they fought for their rights. But there was this other thing that was going on right. to communities that were impacted. And I just felt that we need to name that and connect yes. those dots and not look at anything in a silo. Yes, absolutely. This is why we present together. So starting, I think around a few, a couple of years or maybe a few years ago, I, because of the work that I do, I talk to so many parents. Um, I started to, to really feel that it was disingenuous for me to do presentations on my own. Um, and so this is not our first rodeo and, and, and hope keeps me humble. Hope keeps me right. <laughs> So thank you. Hope. Yes, with every gain, it's um, like reconstruction being followed by by Jim Crow, right? With every gain and every kind of progress, you've seen some other way of shifting, right? So when families without a lot of resources gained access to this, like, you know, as Dorothy Roberts says, if this thing is meant to protect children and support families, yay, we want in. And then as more families come in, the nature of the program shifts according to who's in it, right? All right. And actually the, the, the slide on disproportion on epistemology should have been right here um, because I remember coming across this word disproportionality um, quite a few years ago. And I just, I looked at it for a long time and I was just like, oh, it's really connected to all of these things that we see here, the quantification of decades long, like higher numbers of reports made. So black children and Native American children, actually Native American children as a proportion of the population are um, uh, at, have the most disproportionate numbers of their children removed, et cetera. But in this context that we're talking about is from from the point of a remote a report being made all the way through children actually being reunified, reunified or re-entering the, the child welfare system, um, Black children are experiencing some of the worst outcomes, right? Um, according to the literature. And this was um, a word that was used was disproportionality. And, but I actually have this, this very simple piece of paper in my office um, that says, in bold print, say the thing. And I said, well, I think disproportionality actually really means racism. 
um, because there's no way that it can be inherently that Black people somehow are at risk for this inherently. What about the racism that um, Black families experience? And so um, I'm very happy that there is a growing inquiry into the legacy of anti-Black racism that's actually built into the child welfare system. And it's become such an effective tool within the child welfare system of policing that that's how many families within the communities that Hope and I are a part of here, the, the disruptor communities, the advocacy communities um, in my research work refer to this um, as the family policing system because of the level of um, investigation. There are, fam there are communities in New York City where over half of the families have been investigated. Um, we, uh, I just got, saw some data this week that, that would make, should make your hearts break. Um, and I think in some of the communities that, that you're, you're in right now, you're seeing some of the very same numbers where the higher the concentration of, of families of color or families living with poverty, you're going to see investigations skyrocket. But because of this awareness, um, I see Hope smiling with this slide. <laughs> Because of this awareness of the dichotomy between the way in which the system wants to be perceived for how it operates and how it actually operates, um, a vibrant advocacy community started um, emerging in New York City in around 1980s, right? Um, that was when the peak of child welfare removals in New York City hit about 55,000 out of home placements during that decade. And while that number has shrunken significantly, it's still at an unacceptably high number. I think it's somewhere north of 7,000, somewhere between seven and 8,000 um, children in foster care um, of, in 2019. But those children almost exclusively come from black and brown communities and they almost exclusively come from communities where dollars could be spent to support families versus um, the ways in which they're typically used. So, but nothing about us without us. Hope, I'm gonna stop talking. Tell us what that means to you. Nothing about us without us means that the solutions to the problem are you, the people who are closest to the problem have solutions, they have answers. And it's that the more you are connected to the system, the more you're disconnected from the reality of what's going on. Key point, <clears throat> when during COVID, uh, there was an issue with children going to school and children having laptops. So there was this push to make sure that every child in the Department of New York City Department of Education had access to laptops. So that made sense. That was that was a solution to a problem. The challenge opportunity was that had they known or if they were connected to the ground the way people in the community were, you know that there's a significant number of children who are homeless who live in shelters. And even though they were offering services for people to have access to certain internet services, the shelters did not carry those particular providers or carriers. Had there been people at the table who knew and who were more directly closer to the ground to the problem, there would have been a different conversation about what it looked like, whether it would be iPads or ThinkPads or just that piece of information would have been helpful. And that's just one small example that I'd like to name. So that's why it's important from something as, sm as small as that, just think about the investment in dollars that went into all these laptops. And right. as folks who were working with the community, we found that some of these organizations had to work with making sure that they were set up to receive those particular um, internet provider services because they didn't have them. Mm -hmm. So that's just an example when we say nothing about us without us. Anything that deals with us, someone who's impacted, it's important for us to be at the table. Mm -hmm. And I think 
that's particularly poignant when we think about like disproportionality. Like if everyone is sitting at a table and saying they have the solution to the problem without talking to a parent directly, all the solutions may sound really good and they could get excellent funding. And then you still have kids without access to school because they don't know where they're going to be from one day to the next if they're being shifted from one shelter to the next, right? So if you talk to parents, if you talk to families, you actually hear what they are going through. And I remember I had a conversation with, um, with Jar um, Jarrell, one of our fellow um, Narrowing the Front Door um, colleagues, um, who said, that the number of times he he was um, placed in foster care when he was a young person and um, lived a good portion of his life there and now works on behalf of youth in the foster care system. And he, he it's his words reflected in the title of this, that he's gone to so many meetings where folks are talking around young people. They're talking around parents and they're talking to each other about what the solution to whatever the issue they think is the problem without speaking with the person. And he often, he said, he oftentimes in those meetings simply says, have you asked them? Have you asked them what the problem is, what they think the problem is, not what you think the problem is, but they're living this life, ask them. And then ask them what they think is the best solution to that problem. Stop talking to each other. Speak with people. And when they speak, please listen. So collaborative research means that you're being inclusive from the outset, because when you ask people what is happening when you speak with people about their lives. First, I remember when I, at one of my first studies, one of the mothers I spoke with said, you really want to know what I think? And she asked me why? No one ever asked me. And that was stunning to me. I shared with you that I grew up in Jamaica and that's a common practice. If I want to know something, I ask the person. <laughs> I wasn't raised in this idea of don't ask the person. They're not, they don't know anything. That was not something that I had ever adopted about my life. <laughs> and so when I started my research, I simply just started asking the people that I thought would know about their lives and it was the mothers. So inclusive from the beginning. And that means really being humble enough to know that you don't know everything. And so your methods must be flexible in responding to change. If someone says to you, you are not understanding this issue, we have to go back to the drawing to table, or you have left out an entire series of questions that addresses the issue most important at hand. But above all else, is to actually begin building relationships with families and communities that support the democratization of knowledge, right? It's their knowledge, it's their lives. Hope you said family, communities know this 10 years before we come into the community as researchers, communities already know what it is we're asking them, but how will the community benefit from that knowledge? How will they use it, utilize it after? And that comes from building strong relationships where the sharing is bi-directional, right? It can't be only the researchers walking away with our currency, which is the conference presentation, the paper, the presentation such as this. It's a, it's a privilege to be in this space. And as soon as I I, I was asked, I was like immediately, I was like, Hope, are you available? We've presented to, before, this is a big one. Are you available? Because your voice is needed, your perspective is needed. And Hope is connected to 
a number of organizations where the information flow is bi-directional. And same here. Hope, do you have anything else you wanna to add to this? I mean, um, it's just lean into curiosity. Um, just understand that uh, when you're coming in with your clipboards, uh, people are speaking to you because they hope they don't, there's not that much trust that what they share with you is going to change. They hope that it's going to change and they'll speak with you because they're hoping that I might as well be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Um, but that that's pretty much what you'll you'll be faced with. And 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 also sometimes it's really difficult to hear some of the stories that people share. Um, but they're stories. And the thing you want to focus on is the fact that someone has been able to live through it and to be able to tell their story, to share information in a way that would hopefully create change. Absolutely. And and also just building on that hope as a researcher to conduct the research responsibly so that if you know that you're going in to ask about really emotionally um, challenging questions, develop the resources for referral prior to going into a community. And I don't just mean looking up a name on the internet and handing a piece of paper. I'm talking about calling the intake coordinator, letting them know who you are, letting them know, listen, I'm going to be working with, um, with community members. And I anticipate that some may need some follow up, but I need a warm handling. I need someone to actually answer when this person picks up calls and, and asks for help, because many folks have put this away and they don't want to go revisit it. But if you ask them to revisit it, have an opportunity for them to follow through with help if they choose to, to do so. Um, and also once folks have given the hope is to treat it what they share with respect. And so going back, sharing with community members, this is what I learned from what you said to me. Does this reflect member checking? Does this reflect what you said to me? And if they say no, go back to the drawing board, right? So now I'm going to give you with, um, I want to just check in how much time do I have to give this case example? I'm By my watch, it's about three minutes. Can I, can I use five? I can do it in five, I promise. If you do it in five, we would be grateful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to shoot for even less. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about um, this, um, this study. So my colleagues, uh, Colin Carey Katz and Vicki Lenz and I, um, we put together the study that was funded by an enhanced e-grant from Hunter College, um, where we wanted to understand one of the most, what had been described in much of the, the conversations that I'd had with parents as the most traumatic experiences of their um, of their child welfare cases. And that was some of their experiences in family court. Um, and so we pulled together um, a team of, um, of, of folks who we considered to be uh, directly affected, parents and parent advocates, there were 11 in total, and their attorneys and social workers. Um, we wanted to have a, a, a strong representation of parent voices because this is where decisions were made about families, right? Um, if any of you had a chance to take a look at the article, there's an amazing quote in there by this amazing um, parent advocate who may or may not be on this call, um, <laughs> where they talk, this is your quote, um, Hope, where they talk about the, 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 the courtroom being the judge's domain and that the judge makes those decisions, right? Um, and that even if we think of these spaces as egalitarian and being bias free, that is not how they operate. And so we wanted to get these perspectives to bring light to these experiences of family court um, and involved parents, parent advocates, attorneys and social workers in the development of the interview guides 
to start to talk about, wait a minute, are we getting at the right kinds of knowledge? We want to know um, just in a broad range what helps, what doesn't help. How do you navigate this? How do you survive this? What do you do? What do you not do? We had all sorts of questions. Um, and in those interviews, um, what we learned was that much of what parents and their advocates wanted, um, it, it's not going to be rocket science, but it is, was to be treated fairly. Um, and they found that race, we found that race and class, as we've described here, permeated the family court system, though it was really hard to put your finger on it. Sometimes it was referred to in the ways that someone was dressed. Sometimes it was referred to in the kinds of questions asked particularly of black mothers around who the fathers of their children, the assumption that they had more than one father for their children. We wanted to get to that information to explicate from parents and their, their representatives' viewpoints what it's really like to go into a family court and fight for your kids. I, I see your, your lips pursed. I'm going to stop right there. I'm stopping. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No? Continue? Okay. Um, we wanted to also highlight for many people what it looks like when um, you're going in to fight for your child and you meet the attorney who's fighting on your behalf three minutes before you walk into court. We wanted to distribute that kind of knowledge because someone could say, oh, they have lawyers and social workers, they've got a whole team. But what it's really like when you're, it's arguably the most important moment of your life and you meet the person who will fight for you three minutes before you walk in or that if you have an emotional response, the court will punish you. We wouldn't have gotten those kinds of details, those kinds of information by not talking to parents or by just talking to their attorneys and social workers. We were able to forefront the voices of those who'd been affected and to date have distributed this knowledge in a scholarly manner, but also been in contact with those organizations that participated to disseminate that knowledge back to them so that it can be utilized to effect change in conversations with judges who are typically seen as king of the courtroom. And king, the word king was used, not queen, king. <laughs> and that should tell you a lot. So, this knowledge development is incredibly important. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, the way in which it's conducted is extraordinarily important. And what we learn is um, just remarkably important if we are to make the change, um, affect the change that we'd like to make. Oh. I just don't want us to lose any, uh, any chance to share the... Um the survey with people. This was brilliant. Mary, if you want to come on and explain the purpose of the survey and share your thoughts about the beautiful work that uh, Tricia and Hope have shared, I, um, I I can't thank you enough for being so honest and so real and, um, and making me think in ways I never thought before. Thank you. So let me echo what Lori just said. Uh, two strong um, voiced uh, advocates, scientists, policymakers, now foundation leaders, um, really trying to use science to improve uh, our relationship with and our supports on behalf of young people and their families. And um, I appreciate you focusing on both the process, how you work together, how you put your perspectives together, as well as some of the knowledge that you've tried to put forward, you know, for, for use by many, we hope on this call. The survey is really meant to just kind of tap uh, your experience uh, talking with us today and being part of this discussion. And so um, uh, Nicholas, I know you put it in the chat. 
Um, please take a moment. It's just a few questions to let us gauge uh, your interest and experience uh, here today in the first of six of our webinars. And so with that, I see our time is almost um, at its end. I wonder, um, Ms. Williams, if there is a question that you wanted to pose in the last couple of minutes. Absolutely, I have been just um, mesmerized by the presentation. So there are a couple of things, but I'll get this one in really quickly. Hope, you said the more connected to the system an individual is, researcher, system leader, I'm assuming, the more disconnected you are to reality. Would you expand on that more specifically around what is the disadvantage for families and what is the impact? Absolutely. Um, as someone who's impacted, so when I had my, I'll use my experience. When I was impacted, I was very close to the situation. But the more I learn and grow and learn about the systems, the more I'm disconnected from exactly what's going on to the ground because I'm learning about how the system works. So the only way that I can really stay connected to what's happening is by making sure that I'm still involved with community-based organizations so I can hear what's going on in the ground. Once you continue to work and grow in systems, you learn how they operate and how they're doing things. And you see, okay, everyone is coming with the best of intentions. And then as your situation becomes more stabilized, you can become disconnected from someone else's reality. I never wanted to be that person that when an impacted person talked to me and in their trauma, I could not be there and understand. And that's what I mean about the disconnect. Thank you so much. Last question to you, Trisha. At the very beginning, you had a slide that said something like, if you did nothing else, get this, you must listen. Mm -hmm. What is the litmus test for all involved with marginalized families that you indeed are not listening? Mm -hmm. What is how can individuals challenge themselves and 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 determine, am I really listening? Uh, that is a brilliant question, Cynthia. And I think it's one that that I hope every person who is on this call goes back and really humbly acknowledges that they may have been that person who didn't listen. If you heard in those moments that, you know, you, you didn't ask a person, you didn't say to them, good morning, good morning, Miss Elliot, how are you doing today? Come on in, sit down, tell me what's going on with your family. We're not talking about highly stylized questions, we're talking about humanistic connection. And so it's very possible that you might not be that person, right? Who was there listening all along, but it doesn't mean you can't begin to be that person, right? It doesn't mean, and that's some of the stuff that we learned that even if you started out in one place, you can learn how to ask folks how they're doing. You can learn how to ask them about their families. You can even learn how to ask them about what their families like to do together, because believe it or not, even in the worst of situations, their families who actually still manage to pull something together out of nothing. I oftentimes say, take a family living in poverty and give that those parents a dollar and see what they do with it. Because there are many ways to get to um, connecting with your families and creating meaningful moments that don't require a ton of money. But if we don't see it that way and we don't ask, what they do, then we've missed an opportunity and we should be asking. We should be looking at folks and understanding that they are experts. Thanks to you both. We're at the top of the hour. This has been an amazing presentation. Thank you so very much. And it's been a privilege to meet the both of you as well. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to Mary McKay, who had to make a, a mad dash. But this has been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Enjoy the rest of your day, audience. We thank you for joining us. And it's Thursday, one day before Friday. So yay for the weekend that's coming. With uh, that, I'll say bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>